Hello and welcome everyone to the third podcast for, for day 37 as we're talking about community ecology. In this podcast, we're going to talk about objective two. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's begin this podcast with talking about diversity, at least diversity as we think of it in ecology terms. We can quantify diversity using these two terms, species richness and relative abundance. Species richness means the number of different species. Relative abundance is the proportion of the community made up of different species. And relative abundance is the proportion each species represents of all individuals in the community. So to further discuss this, I think it's important for us to look at a picture in your textbook. So we can look at this figure right here and we can ask which of these two communities is more diverse. We can look at species richness and see that they all contain some species A, which looks like this tree, some species B, which looks like this tree, some species C, which looks like this tree, and some species D, which looks like this tree. We can look at community two and also see that they contain the same species. So we can say that at the level of species richness, these two communities are the same. Okay, let's look at relative abundance next. We can see that in community one, each of the four species, A through D, are equally represented. In community two, we see all four species there, which goes towards species richness, but we can see that species A is much more predominant. 80% of the trees are of species A. We might look at these and intuitively think that species, I mean, I'm sorry, community one is more diverse. And your book goes on to talk about a, a fairly complicated looking equation to confirm that indeed community one is more diverse. We're not going to ask you to uh, apply that equation or know that equation or quite frankly even look at that equation. But you should be familiar with these two aspects of describing diversity, species richness and relative abundance. And you should be able to tell by looking at two pictures what the richness is, it has four species, it has four species, and then the relative abundance of them. And you might be able to make an intuitive guess that this is more, more diverse. But you should, again, really be familiar with the terms that describe diversity. Now, why do we care about diversity? Well, we know that to incre increase stability, that diversity matters. So we know a community that has, so let's write community, with more diversity, let's say greater diversity, and this considers both species richness and relative abundance, that these communities with greater diversity will be more stable. They're less resistant to change. It's harder to affect a community that's very, very diverse because they're, able, they're going to be able to rebound much quicker. A community that has greater diversity in times of a drought, say, if we're thinking about our trees on our last example, times of drought, they're going to be able to withstand that a lot better. And when, when water comes back, they'll be able to rebound quicker too because they have such a, a, such a greater diversity. Then on the other hand, with a community with lesser diversity won't do as well. We also know that communities with greater diversity are more resistant to um, invasive species. So in general, diversity matters. More diversity, it's better for the community. As we're thinking about diversity and why it matters, let's introduce this topic of 
trophic structure. And we can define this simply as the feeding relationships among the species within a community. As we begin our discussion of food chains and food webs, I want to move to this PowerPoint slide. I think it shows it a lot better than, than I could draw it. When we look at a food chain, and also a food web, which we'll show on the next slide, what we're really looking at is how energy is transferred from the bottom of the chain to the top. And we always draw an arrow going in the direction of energy, energy transfer, not in the direction of what's eating what. So for instance, this snake here is not eating this, this um, eagle or falcon here. It's saying that the energy is transferred from this snake here to this falcon because the falcon is eating it. Okay, so let's define a couple terms here. This is a primary producer. Primary producers are going to be your header, I'm sorry, your autotrophs at the very bottom of the food chain. These organisms make their own carbon structures. They make all the things they need by bringing in CO2. Then we have our consumers. Everything else is a consumer. So we have our primary consumer. Primary consumers eat the primary producers. So the energy goes from the producers to this primary consumer. And then our secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. So this little rat here is eating the cricket or grasshopper here. And the energy from this grasshopper now is being transferred to this rat. Now the secondary consumer is going to be eaten by the tertiary consumer. And so this snake is going to eat this rat. So the energy from this rat is moving into the, the snake. Then finally, this falcon or hawk up here is going to eat this snake. And so the energy from the snake is moving to the hawk. This is a nice way to look at how energy moves between the organisms. The, the one problem with food chains here is that it makes an assumption that every energy transfer has to move in this way that you would never have a tertiary consumer that might eat a primary consumer. So it's limited in that way. So often a better way to look at these things is with a food web. So let's look at a food web. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a food web. And a food web is nicer because it, it looks at the entire sum of all the energy within a community. And it's not limited based on a single direction of moving from from producers to primary to secondary to tertiary. Still, we follow the same rules. We're still going to have our producers down here at the bottom, the one, the, the autotrophs, the plants. They're still going to be consumed by the primary consumers. These would be our herbivores. Things get a little bit more complicated when we look at this next layer here, where our secondary consumers would be at. We can see that, as we saw on the last, on the food chain, that this mouse here is eating the cricket or the grasshopper, and that's great. But we also know that this mouse may also eat some of the producers. So it feeds at two different trophic le le levels. It feeds at this trophic level of primary consumer and also this trophic level of producers. So energy is transferred from either this producer layer uh, trophic level or from the primary consumer trophic level. Let's see if we can find another example. So you have this snake here and you can see it traditionally would be thought of as a tertiary consumer but it gets its energy from sometimes eating primary consumers like this mouse here or this what looks like a chipmunk but it may also get it from this larger rodent here. So it's feeding at the secondary consumer trophic level and also the primary trophic level. Same thing with the hawk up here. It's feeding at the tertiary con uh, consumer level where the snake is, but it's also feeding down here at the primary consumer level where it's eating on these smaller rodents and also these larger rodents. So a food web is, is better because it's more complete. It identifies all the different trophic levels that a consumer is feeding at.
the last thing we need to talk about in this podcast is the difference between a dominant species and a keystone species. And I also want to talk about a flaw to the idea of a keystone species. A dominant species would be that species within a community that has the highest abundance, the most abundance or the highest biomass. So let's say species in a community that has the most abundance or another way you can think of it as the highest biomass and when we say highest biomass what we're saying is which one weighs the most adds the most mass to that community so a species can become dominant for several reasons it, it might be that it can avoid it's better at avoiding predation another idea is that it's better at using the resources alright now let's talk about keystone species Keystone species, they don't have to be the dominant species. In fact, they are often a species that is, is low in number, but they play a central role in the community. So let's play play central role. In community. They exert this control not because of the vast numbers they have, but because of the key ecological role they play. Often when we remove a keystone species from a pop from a community, it affects the whole community because all the members of that community rely upon that keystone species. Sometimes a dominant species you could remove and it doesn't have as much of an effect on the community as, as a whole. But these keystone species, they play a, a pivotal role in, in maintaining this community. Now the, the one problem with a keystone species as we're learning is that often a community will have many keystone species and, and in fact in some communities, one might argue that removing any organism from it, because they're all reliant upon them, each other, because of the, the inter, interwoven trophic structure. And so if you remove any species, you can have an effect on the community. But for, for the purpose of this class, let's recognize that keystone species, they don't have to be dominant species. They play a pivotal role in a community because of the role they play in that in that community because of the the role in that ecological niche that they occupy and if you remove these keystone species results in for lack of a better way of saying it big changes they play a pivotal role and we can't remove them all right that ends this third podcast for Chapter 54, Day 37. If you have any questions, let us know. We'll see you in class. Bye.